Good morning. Welcome to our time together. It is a delight and a joy to be together, to turn our hearts and our minds towards the worship of our Lord and Savior, to remember how mighty is the Lord our God. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we come to you just so full of awe as to who you are, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for your mighty love. We just rejoice. We rejoice to be your people. What a privilege to know you, Lord, to be taught by you. We cry out this morning that you teach us your ways. We are humbly before your feet, ready and eager to learn who you are and who we are in you, Lord. We thank you for your life that you've given us. We thank you that we woke up this morning, Lord. We rejoice to be your people. We do have people that we care about, Lord, and we lift them up to you now. You know each and every situation. You know the loved ones that need your healing touch in their body. You know those we're thinking about now that need to be guided by your peace. Lord, you know those who are having a difficulty in their physical bodies, their relationships, perhaps their finances or careers. We surrender their care to your good hand. We trust that you will work in and through the situations that they are experiencing to be mighty, to let your love be felt and your presence be known by all. That, that people would look at them and see your glory shining round about them. Lord, we pray this for ourselves as well. We need you, Lord. Who are we without you? We come to you from this place of utter and absolute reliance upon you, not ourselves. And we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to sing a song for you, Lord. Lord, for you I want to sing a song. And I sing about your love, your goodness, Lord, your righteousness. I want to sing a song of your faithfulness, song of your grace, and of your love and kindness to the glory of your name. With everything that's in me, Lord, listen to me. 
even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Our first passage of scripture comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In the second passage... 1 Timothy chapter 3, I'll read verses 1 to 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had a frenemy in church youth group when I was a teenager. His name was Rick. He was popular, good looking, girls liked him. So naturally I hated him. <laughs> but he was also very uh, conceited about it, and he picked on me, too, a lot. Anyway, Rick was also very predictable because every time we went on a youth group retreat or a church summer camp, a couple of times each year, you could count on Rick on the last night of the retreat, responding to the youth pastor's altar call and walking down the aisle to receive Christ as his Savior and Lord. And he was always in tears and always emotional. And I wanted to say, Rick, didn't you do this six months ago? And I'm sure he would have said, yes, but this time I really mean it, I promise. And I'm like, how many times do you have to get saved before you're finally saved? Besides, Maybe if you stopped picking on me so much, you wouldn't feel so guilty all the time. I didn't say that, but I was, I was thinking that. I make light of it now, but, but it also makes me sad because if I had the knowledge and maturity and wisdom to, to have been Rick's pastor back then, I would have counseled him by saying something like this. Rick, the reason that you felt the need to accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, which is a once-in-a-lifetime decision that you've made about eight times since I've known you. But the reason you've done this is because you're not really trusting in Jesus to save you. You're trusting in Jesus plus your own good works, or Jesus plus your own righteousness, or Jesus 
plus your ability to prove that you're a good person after all. But you don't get it, Rick. When it comes to salvation, it's not Jesus plus anything else. It's Jesus, period. Put your trust in him for your salvation, in him alone, rather than in yourself. And Rick might have responded, but I'm a really bad person. I've sinned so much. I don't deserve to be saved. And I would have said, exactly. <laughs> You're almost there. You almost understand the gospel. You're almost a Christian. And if he still didn't believe me, then I might show him today's scripture, the passage from Matthew 22. It shares a lot in common with the parable that I preached on a few weeks ago, which was in the previous chapter, the parable of the vineyard. As with the previous parable, today's, in today's scripture, Jesus is speaking to religious leaders in Jerusalem, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, two different Jewish denominations. He's pronouncing judgment on them for failing to believe God's word about the Messiah. And he's pronouncing both a word of hope and a word of warning for the rest of us, especially those of us who are in church this morning. He wants his disciples to hear and to heed his warning. So hope and warning, that's what this sermon is about in that order. So let's look at hope first. In verses 8 and 9, the king has a problem. The wedding feast for the king's son is ready, but the wedding hall is empty because all the powerful, wealthy, important, elite people that he originally invited turned him down. In fact, they committed treason against the king by murdering his ambassadors. What's the king going to do now? It won't do to have a wedding feast for a king's son in an empty wedding hall. That would be shameful. We've got to fill this place up, he thinks. So he sends his servants out with this mission. Go out onto the busiest streets in the city and invite literally everyone you find to come to the feast. By the way, Jesus tells a, a slightly different version of this parable in Luke's gospel in which the king sends his servants out a second time farther afield because after their first trip, there's still more room in the banquet hall and the king wants it to be full. The point is, in both cases, the king is not being picky. <laughs> He's not being selective. He's not... He's not, you know, working for the admissions office at Harvard University. The king's admission rate is 100%. He's inviting everyone he can find. Look at verse 10. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests, both bad and good. Remember my friend Rick at the beginning of the sermon? If I could, I would show him this verse. You think you're bad? Guess what? You are. Yet you are welcome at God's heavenly banquet table. Your badness doesn't exclude you. And of course, Jesus means good and bad in popular terms, the way his listeners would understand good and bad. For example, the prostitutes and the tax collectors were, who were repenting and believing in Christ were the worst people imaginable, yet Jesus said they're being saved. But elsewhere, of course, when Jesus is speaking in a more theologically nuanced language, he makes it clear that really, there are no good people. We are all bad. We are all helpless sinners apart from God's grace. I've been reading and journaling my way through 1 Timothy during my quiet times recently. I didn't have high hopes when I came to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I saw that the heading was qualifications for overseers. 
And an overseer in Greek is episkopos, which is a word that we usually translate as bishop. So these are qualifications for bishops. And I was thinking, this is going to be so boring and irrelevant for my life and my ministry. But I was wrong. Paul begins by saying, like an overseer... uh, (laughs) Excuse me, Paul begins by saying, an overseer must be above reproach. Well, sure, that makes sense. He writes, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And I'm thinking, of course, Paul, these are all obviously good qualifications for a bishop. Tell me something I don't know. But then he goes on in the next couple of verses, and he says, um, a bishop must not be a drunkard. Today we might say an alcoholic or a drug addict. He must not be violent. (laughs) Violent? Would any of you describe yourself as violent? (laughs) He must not be a lover of money. He must manage his household well and have well-behaved children. He must not be puffed up with conceit. And there are other things which I read, and you might be wondering why I put these two scriptures together, but I hope it becomes clear. But what struck me, or I should say, what the Lord struck me over the head with, was this thought. Paul is listing qualifications for becoming a bishop, for serving the highest office in the church. He's not listing qualifications for being a member in good standing in the church. In other words, he's not listing qualifications for becoming a Christian. He's not listing qualifications for becoming a member of the body of Christ, for being born again, for being saved. This should be incredibly good news for us. This should be incredibly incredibly good news for my old youth group nemesis, Rick. It should be incredibly good news that Timothy's church in Ephesus, in other churches that Paul started around the Mediterranean, were filled with what we would consider worldly, sinful, disreputable people who did not have their act together. It should be incredibly good news to us that members of these earliest churches, you know, back in the good old days, were not required to have their act together before they professed faith in Christ and were saved. Think about it. Paul actually has to tell Timothy that drunkards or alcoholics or drug addicts can't serve as bishops. Why? Because Timothy is obviously pastoring a church where there are plenty of alcoholics and drug addicts to choose from. He has to tell Timothy that violent men can't serve as bishops because there are plenty of violent men in his church to choose from. He has to tell Timothy that lovers of money can't serve as bishops because there are plenty of lovers of money in his church to choose from. What is wrong with this messed up church that there are so many outwardly sinful people, so many problem people, so many people who don't have their act together? What is wrong with this church? And the answer is nothing. (laughs) Nothing at all is wrong with this church. There are, there are plenty of things wrong with the Christians who are members of this church, but isn't that the point? <laughs> the church is being exactly the kind of hospital for sinners that God intends for a church to be, and that we always say that it's supposed to be. See, I worry that contemporary Methodist churches and most other mainstream churches in America are less a hospital for sinners and more of a minute clinic for Christians who make a mistake every once in a while. Serious cases of sin, they better go somewhere else for help. There's a very popular megachurch pastor in America. Some of you love him and watch him on TV. You read his books. Some of you, including myself, often criticize him 
because his theology at times is severely deficient. I'm not going to say his name, and I'm also not minimizing the severe deficiencies in his theology. But I watch short sermon clips of his on social media sometimes, and here's something I notice about his preaching that he gets exactly right. He speaks directly to members of his church who are opioid addicts and alcoholics and who struggle with other kinds of harmful addictions. And he speaks to them with dignity and respect. And he speaks to them as if they are brothers and sisters in Christ because he assumes they are. And he speaks to them as if their addiction did not disqualify them from becoming Christians in the first place. And he speaks to them with the firm conviction that Jesus did not wait for these sinners to clean up their act before saving them. And so this preacher has a very encouraging message even for them. He tells them that Jesus has the power to heal them of their addiction, that Jesus wants to heal them of their addiction, and that Jesus will heal them of their addiction so long as they keep on trusting in Jesus. Look, I can criticize this preacher with the best of them, I promise. But he's not wrong about that, is he? And I know that, that even Christians overdose from drug addiction and destroy their lives and destroy the lives of others because of their addictions. Some of you have known and loved Christians who've overdosed from addictions. I've done funerals for these kinds of Christians. That doesn't, that doesn't prove Jesus didn't want to heal them or didn't have the power to heal them. It only means that Jesus finally and completely did heal them of their addiction after they got to heaven. The same way he'll completely heal the rest of us sinners who perhaps have more respectable sins. And when I say respectable sins, I'm not talking about sins that are necessarily less spiritually deadly, only sins that, you know, we manage to hide from others more successfully. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. I wish church could be more like Alcoholics Anonymous, because at least in AA, no one is pretending to be someone other than what they are. They, they tell you up front, I'm Steve and I'm an alcoholic. What if church was more like that? I'm Brent and I'm a sinner. I'm not any better than you. I'm powerless over this problem. I, I, I'm no less in need of God's grace than you. I'm in recovery from sin, just like you. And I'm trusting in God's grace to give me the power to overcome my sin. And it's, and it's a one day at a time thing for me, just like it is for you. And if I fall off the wagon, no one's going to judge me or kick me out. Instead, they'll, they'll dust me off and help me get back on my feet again. That's what church is supposed to be like. It's not this place where we're supposed to pretend like everything is okay. Because if it's not, we'll be judged or ostracized. That's what Paul and Timothy's church and churches are like. A church that the, the Holy Spirit surely intends to serve as a model church for us today, which is why the Spirit included these words in the pages of the Bible. This is a church that is filled with both kinds of sinners, the respectable ones and the unrespectable ones. A church that says, we don't care which kind of sinner you are. You belong here so long as you're honest with God about your sins so he can heal you of them. A part of the healing is knowing exactly where you fall short. But I like Paul and Timothy's church because they understood Jesus's message of grace in this parable because they actually did go out into the streets and invite both the bad and the good into God's heavenly banquet. And when they did, guess what happened? A lot of these 
bad people accepted the invitation. And Paul and Timothy threw open the doors of the banquet hall, wide open for them, and welcomed them into the feast because every single one of them was saved by God's grace alone through faith in Christ alone. None of them was disqualified because they didn't already have their act together. And neither are you. And if I could be like Marty McFly and get into a time machine and travel back to 1985, which would be awesome, by the way. (laughs) That's also the message I would share with my frenemy, Rick, who couldn't stop worrying about his sins and whether they disqualified him for salvation. I would tell him, it's not your sins that disqualify you, Rick. It's your lack of faith in what Christ accomplished on the cross that disqualifies you. Confess your lack of faith as one of your sins and see if Christ won't give you the faith to actually believe him when he says he's done everything necessary to make forgiveness of your sins possible. Past, present, and future. All of your sins wiped out. All of your sins punished all of your sins nailed to the cross, so you can stand before God with the righteousness of Christ covering you. You can stand before God and be accepted by God as a member of his family. Pray for that kind of faith and believe in Jesus. Say, along with the man in Mark 9, 24, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Friends, do you see the grace here. What's stopping you from receiving this gift of eternal life from God? But even as I, even as you hear me say these words, um, some of you are waiting for the other shoe to drop because I didn't stop reading at verse 10. I went on to read verses 11 to 14, and frankly, those verses are terrifying There's a man at the wedding feast who's not wearing a proper wedding garment. So the king says to his servants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These words are a recurring uh, poetic description of hell, which Jesus uses in many places. Therefore, Jesus makes clear that if we're not wearing a wedding garment, whatever that means, we will not enjoy his heavenly banquet. We will be separated from God for eternity. We better make sure we're wearing it, right? Whatever it is. Let's try to figure out what it is. In the ancient world, when a king threw a royal dinner party, it was customary for the king to provide his guests with proper clothing to wear. We even see a couple of examples of this in the Bible. Genesis 45, 22 and Esther 6, 8 and 9. But even more, notice that the king's servants usher in all of these people off of the street immediately. Um, Because remember, the, the, the meal is ready right now. Even if these people owned or could afford the proper attire, and keep in mind that most of them were poor, they still would have had time to purchase what they needed or or go home and change. If they were going to be properly dressed, it was only because the king would supply everything these newly invited guests needed in order to enjoy the banquet. All these guests had to do was to receive what was offered to them, put it on, and show up. (laughs) I mean, that's not much. It's shocking that even one of the invited guests failed to meet this bare minimum requirement. What lack of respect must he, must he have had for the king to not even bother to put on this fine suit, a suit fit for royalty, which he didn't even have to purchase, but was given as a free gift? How does this insolent behavior 
honor the king who invited him and paid his way. The king is not asking the man to attend a funeral after all, but the biggest party imaginable. Even an ordinary wedding reception in a small village in the ancient Near East was an event that no one would want to miss. It was fun. It was a celebration. It brought great joy. Imagine being invited to a king's wedding reception. And yet, this parable asks, what about us? God is offering us eternal life with him, and he's paid an infinite price uh, for this gift that he's offering us. And that price was the death of his son Jesus on the cross. And God is telling us, claim this gift. Enjoy this life eternally. Enjoy it more than you can enjoy any pleasure that the world has to offer. And celebrate this life with me forever. It's yours. It's available now. It's free. Just receive it. That's what God is saying to us right now. Yet how many of us are like those originally invited guests. In verse 5, we pay no attention. We're preoccupied with other things. We go about our business. We go about our busy life without, without giving God's invitation a second thought. Or maybe we think, I'll get ready later. I'll get ready later. Friends, later isn't guaranteed. You know that. Suppose the Lord guided me to pick this scripture to preach on this morning so that you would hear Jesus' warning. Because you know right now, if you were to die, you would be like that man who shows up at the wedding hall without the proper garment. Do you still want to take that chance that you've got plenty of time? The time is now, friends. Repent and believe. Amen. of love that's calling There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands everything you're going through shadows of your shame But there's a light of hope that's shining Won't you come and take your place Bring it all to the table It's nothing he ain't seen before Savior, any cause, bring it all to the table. 
There's nothing he ain't seen before For all your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness There's a Savior at he calls Bring it all to the table from us. 